Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And joining me, fortunately for me, is Tho Bishop, my co-host. And we're going to talk about Independence Day today, or what I always called when I was a kid, Fourth of July. Because I, I, I just knew it was a fun day with fireworks. And uh, we're, we're going to cover the American Revolution specifically and, and ideas about it. And was it a good thing? and Rothbard's opinion of it. So we'll go over that in some detail. I just want to remind everybody also that coming up uh, in October is our supporter summit with the Mises Institute. That's at the Omni Hilton Head Oceanfront Resort on Hilton Head Island. That is October 10 through 12, 2024. Come on over. Our main special guest is Tom Luongo, who you may be familiar with. And uh, we've got, of course, our usual full lineup Lou Rockwell, Tom DiLorenzo, uh, Joe Salerno, Guido Holzman, Tom Woods, all the gang. I'll be there too. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll cover a wide variety of topics. This is basically a vacation for Mises Institute supporters. So coming out to the beach in October, we'll all be together. You'll get a chance to meet a lot of the speakers and also uh, hear talks from them. So go to mises.org, that's mises.org, and just click on events, and you can register there. All right, well, let's talk about the American Revolution. Let's talk about the 4th of July and Independence Day, Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, that sort of stuff. Uh, though, as you know, uh, there are there are some libertarians out there who think the American Revolution was a bad idea. And I do not agree with that point of view. Let's just get that out there. <laughs> I don't buy into that idea, uh, which to me has become all the more apparent in recent years because just a few years ago, what the people who oppose the American Revolution would say is, well, we should have never had the revolution because then we would be like these even more awesome places, Australia and Canada. And they love freedom in Australia and Canada. And they're not like Americans. And just look at these countries. They're rich and they're like America, but better. And the last few years, boy, I have no desire to live in Canada or Australia because, first of all, their reaction to COVID was uh, just awful. No regard for human rights whatsoever. What really matters in these countries is adherence to what, what the whole thinks. You're, you're uncivilized if you don't go along with what society demands. There's very much, much more a collectivist attitude in these countries. And what's interesting is uh, talking to David Hart about it, who's Australian, he, and this will come into it, he's got a whole theory for that. And part of it being that those countries unlike America, adhere to later liberal British ideas. Stuff there. The people who are their liberal leaders in terms of political philosophy are people like Jeremy Bentham and people like John Stuart Mill, nine, later 19th century quote-unquote liberals who are nothing like the American model for liberalism, which is John Locke which is the English Civil War type stuff, you know, that whole Bill of Rights thing. And so it's a completely different conception of liberalism where their liberalism, the Canadian-Australian version of liberalism, their philosophical touchstone is much more a collectivist ideal where, yeah, freedom's good and everything, but you have to bow to the majority. You have to, law and order is what really matters. We, we have experts to tell us how to do these things. And that's very much a... Uh, a Benthamite idea. I don't even know why that guy's called a liberal, um, but that's, uh, that's, that's an issue there. So uh, that's something I'd actually like to explore at some point on a future podcast. But that just illustrates, I think, some of these big differences between the United States' conception of revolution and independence and their conception of it. And then the overall issue, too, is just the fact that it was the American revolutionaries who created the whole the, the evidence who, who pioneered the idea that there is a right to revolution, that you can secede from a larger political entity, and this is all moral, this is all acceptable, this can all lead to good things later on. 
so if you're opposed to the American Revolution, uh, well, then I guess you don't care about Independence Day at all. Uh, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's just not something. Uh, I guess you can go uh, talk about how great Justin Trudeau is or something like that. So let's talk about it in some detail as, and really its historical roots, uh, though. And I guess as I'm going to start off with what's what might sound to some people like a trite statement, like I'm a reporter trying to just like do some icebreakers. But l let me put it to you this way, though. What does the American Revolution mean to you? Uh, American exceptionalism, Ryan, of course. No. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking about just the, the numbers that we're going to do with a good Bentham bashing podcast. That's going to be some, some great content there. Looking forward to that. Um, no, but I, I think that one of the things I find fascinating with, with Rothbard's work in particular um, is – Again, you know, we, we've talked about this a great deal is the way that his intersection of his economic work, his historical work, and his work on strategy, um, the degree that complement each other, the degree to which I think aspects of one help propel the successes of others. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's always been fascinating the extent to which he really places the American Revolution within his views on libertarian strategy and as an important historical moment for going forward, right? Even in the modern day, examples there of, of what does a successful libertarian project look like? And the American Revolution itself, you know, was a great libertarian moment in human existence. And I think that some of the, the angst out there about the revolution from a libertarian perspective, I've reread uh, uh, Gary North, um, among those who are the most critical, who I, I have most respect for, um, they, his, his criticism, right, is that, you know, afterwards the tax burden on Americans was higher than, you know, in seven, than, than you had in you know, July 1st, 1776, right? But of course that's, that really is a critique of the constitution itself. It's a critique of the government that came afterwards that has to be separated from, um, the conversation of the American revolution itself. And what was the inspiration for the American revolution? It was a, a victory of these liberal ideas of, you know, recognizing uh, the, the inherent nature of, of natural rights, of human liberty, of recognizing that right to secession, um, you know, of the intellectual framework being laid down through works such as um, uh, John Locke, but particularly Cato's letters, which I don't think it's nearly enough attention. I think as Rothbard points out, um, you know, Cato's letters was even more radical in a good way than, um, than Locke's work was. And so it really it illustrates it's it's a dynamic of the extent to which you had a, a people that were absorbing these ideas that took on that level of, of self-reliance and self-determination um, that was organized by radical leaders seeking radical ends, not simply kind of pragmatic opportunist, um, you know, which, you know, Plenty, plenty in that time of day, but you had organizations in place dedicated for this higher calling of, of uh, you know, you know, bringing into action a defense of the rights of American colonists. And you know, there is, you know, right now I think there's been a, a lot of interesting discussion of late about, or, or become more popular. These are longstanding debates. I don't want to try to pretend that this is something new and modern and trendy. Um, you know, but I, I think there are valid conversations to be had about the extent of you know the Enlightenment broadly defined, right, in, in its view in society. It's it's there's there's been a a you know it has become trendy to to kind of uh, question and um, you know rethink a lot of inherit you know, a lot of the the popular words right of of liberalism. Again, definition of that will differ differ greatly, right? Of of these you know, kind of self-actualization types of political movements that occurred um, in the 17 and 1800s uh, within the West. But the American Revolution, I think, can always stand apart from this, right? I think Rothbard you know, distinguishes the American Revolution as a, a war of, of national self-determination rather than kind of a, a full or sort of political revolution and obviously the French sense being the, the most obvious there. And so, you know, if I think there is, there is tremendous value, particularly for an American audience, um, though, again, I think the strategy aspects have a much broader um, relevance to anyone um, out there. Again, understanding the, the importance of, of education and, and understanding the importance of organization, understanding um, you know, elements that brought 
the American colonists to this point. There's, I think, universal value in that for those that are desiring a more libertarian future. But it, it is important not to allow these extra elements to take away from what was a truly great moment for individual liberty in the course of human civilization because you know we don't have many of those out there, right? This is a day that we can have. This is a day that, that we can uh, wholeheartedly endorse. Um, and again, this is part of, I think, that the, the great American legacy that I think is still one of our best aspects in terms of communicating radical ideas, ideas that are are very separated from, you know, obviously what you're going to learn in, in school, what you're going to learn in the press, right? You know, there is there's still this heartbeat of this, you know, don't tread on me mentality that a large portion of the American populace, population resonates with. And typically our ideas are at their strongest when we tap into that kind of uniquely American tradition and heritage, and rather than trying to impose something kind of, you know, futuristic, right? You know, post transhumanist, right? Like all this sort of, you know, kind of, kind of crazy mumbo jumbo of of the future. That you know, there's something unique and raw and 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 extremely vital, and again, worth defending and worth celebrating of the uniqueness of this American nation that was, to use the words of Mary Rothbard, a nation conceived in liberty. Yeah, that's something they can never take away from us until they just erase the American Revolution and the facts about it from the history books, which I'm sure they'll try to do at some point. Um, they tolerate it in the history books because it's just such an undeniable reality. Well, that's why Juneteenth is our new national independence day, Ryan. You got to get up with the times. <laughs> the, well, I can tell you, there were. I live in a rather diverse neighborhood and there weren't any parades here about it. Uh, oh, where, whereas on July 4th, there is a spontaneous July 4th parade with children and adults and everything. So Juneteenth has a ways to go. Uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> I think it's quite interesting to have a country founded on the idea of picking up a gun and shooting a government employee, a government agent. Uh, and that, that's just the reality right? How did this war start? It was a bunch of guys from the government, let's say FBI agents and their minions, uh, to use uh, modern terminology. They decided to go to a small town in Massachusetts and take all the guns because that's those people might use those guns to do bad things that the regime doesn't like. So all of these FBI agent type guys, uh, they get together, they're shock troops, and they, they march uh, to go get the guns. And then what happens? A bunch of Americans picked up guns and shot those shock troops, those FBI agent guys. And today we celebrate that uh, because that was a great blow for liberty because that is what people should do uh, in some cases when their rights are violated. Now, let's be crystal clear. I'm not saying you should go out and shoot any FBI agents. I'm just drawing a his historical analogy there, no noting that these were agents just as we have agents here today of the government. They're, they weren't any different. These, these guys in red coats, they weren't any different than American generals, than American federal agents, than ATF guys. They were the exact same sort of person doing the exact same sort of thing. And the American Revolution was a, was a matter of armed resistance to those people. And that's just simply the reality. That is what happened historically. And that's what Independence Day uh, essentially is about. And it's very difficult to erase that. Um, now, one could argue that that can't be repeated, right? In the 18th century, the, the central state was, was much weaker. Uh, I would suggest that using a similar strategy would just lead to totalitarianism today that you probably need to come up with a different strategy. Um, but the fact that they were employing real resistance, uh, that was illegal, that was considered treasonous, is a very important factor that cannot be denied. And we should also note that a lot of what modern libertarians just take for granted would not exist had it not been for the American Revolution. They act like the self-rule achieved by places like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada would have existed without the American Revolution. There's no evidence of that. Those, the fact that self-rule was granted to those colonies 
was a result of the American Revolution. It was the knowledge that if you didn't grant self-rule to these places, that you might end up with an American Revolution type situation. And so to, to use the words of David Armitage, the, uh, the historian who talks about this concept of self-determination, local rule, this is a new thing in the American Revolution. And he says this here, uh, speaking on the American Revolution, he says, the notion that one people might find it necessary to dissolve its links with a larger polity, and he's, of course, kind of paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence here. That is, that it might legitimately attempt to secede was almost entirely unprecedented and barely accepted at the time of the American Revolution, unquote. So all these people who talk today, whether we're talking about decolonization, we're talking about the idea that you have some right to self-rule, this was a novelty in the 18th century among the American revolutionaries. And they established that as a natural right, as something that you could do, as, as a form of resistance that could take place. And Rothbard, of course, was very much well aware of this. This is why, as you mentioned, he talked about the revolution as a, a form of national liberation. Certainly, he and both Mises talked about in terms of self-determination. These are rights that people have, and they were rights that had never really been exercised and certainly weren't uh, regarded as negotiable or respectable by the ruling classes uh, of the colonial powers. It was only the American Revolution that created the impression that these colonial powers had to at least listen and negotiate when local populations wanted to exercise some sort of self-determination. So you're going to have a, a ways to go to convince me that none of that should have ever happened and that we should have just gone on with centralized imperial powers being able to do whatever they want. I think the best argument you could make is that the American Revolution made no difference. To argue that it actually led to worse stuff, that's, I, I've, I've been looking for the historical evidence of that and I'm not seeing that. Because the argument that taxes went up after the American Revolution, A, as you know, uh, so that wasn't a problem with the revolution. It was a problem with the counter-revolution that came afterward, and that was the creation of the, the current federal constitution, not to be confused with the real first constitution, which was the Articles of Confederation. And that was the problem there. It wasn't the fact that the U.S. had seceded. And also, find me a state where taxes didn't go up in the 19th century. Uh, the tax burden, the welfare state, these were all in full swing in Europe in the 18th century. And in France, absolutism was running amok, certainly in Spain. You had the Italians moving toward unification in the 19th century, the same with the Germans and Bismarck. And what you're telling me is that if, if the U.S. had just stayed part of Britain, it wouldn't have had any of those problems, that the reason the U.S., uh, was following a similar trajectory, albeit a much better trajectory than the Germans and the Italians and the Spaniards and the French in the 19th century, uh, and the British, by the way, uh, was <laughs> there just should have been no revolution because we would have been much better off than the rest of the, uh, the Western world. I just see no evidence of that. You could say that, oh, the U.S. followed a similar trajectory, so the revolution didn't prevent that. Uh, you could argue that, but I think there was other benefits than... Uh, to the revolution. Uh, so uh, just looking at the fact that, okay, the Americans, the American people, the American culture, political culture is founded on this premise of armed rebellion, this premise of resistance to, to an established legal regime. That's, that's something that's very important. And then just the other aspect uh, being that it established globally this concept of self-determination and secession as both a moral and a legal right that of course, not just Americans, but many, many different sorts of people have uh, exercised over the centuries. And of course, that global significance of that uh, recognition of that 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 global right of, of self determination, right, has been has you know that has become an awkward point for what America has become. And again, obviously, you know, we, we are we are. Uh, have no shortage of critiques of the American Empire, right? You know, the, the what what America has become since then is is a 
you know, a, a, a entity worth constant condemnation. Um, and again, particularly within the 20th century, um, you know, it has been the failure to uphold the values of America's founding that has created, um, you know, very obvious hypocrisy and undermined, you know, what, what that era of, you know, what, if, if there's any capital that exists of, you know, what is prominently called American exceptionalism, that exceptionalism exists from the model and success of the American Revolution and everything that has come since then, um, with perhaps brief blips um, undoing some of those sins at points during that process, you know, it, it has been against the spirit and stated aims of that revolution. It has been a, a, a betrayal of that revolution that has given rise to everything since. But even that argument, right, you know, the, 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 it is the same argument that comes up still contemporary. Uh, it's, it, it is the same argument that comes up in contemporary arguments about secession today, right? Oh, well, if you have, you know, if, if, if you know, Texas breaks away from the United States, then, and, you know, whatever your, your boogeyman negative outcome there, right? Oh, it's going to become a, you know, hands made tail theocracy and yada, 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 right? You know, whatever, whatever bad scenario comes afterwards is different from, do individuals have that right to self-determination? Do peoples have a, an ability to break away from the relationship, you know, for, you know, break, break away from a governing entity that they have defined as tyrannical? Do, does, does that right exist within human society? And the American Revolution is, again, it, it is a moment of taking theory and putting it into practice. And practice is not always going to be as neat and clean and tidy as theory. And so any attempts to, to walk back what those origins are, what that inspiration was, I think is, is a massive, um, it's if you, particularly from a libertarian perspective, right? There, there, there might be other forms of ideologies that would have value in diminishing the importance of the American Revolution, right? If, if your desire is explicitly more concentrated control, if your desire is explicitly um, a, a uh, restraint of of um, individual liberty, of property rights, of that, right? Then, then it makes all the sense in the world, right, to to demean and diminish the the relevance of the American Revolution. But from if, but from a libertarian perspective, if liberty is your aim, um, then it, it is a moment of great celebration. Again, in a a moment that continues to have relevance in today's world, um, and both from a practical propaganda standpoint and trying to get people to our cause, but also, again, understanding what allows, what, what, what is the, the conditions that allows for such a, success, a successful and radical, radical political act. Um, because if you are upset and tired and if, 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 you know, if it's easy to have critiques and do nothing about it, it's, it's easy to, to be completely black pilled and have no hope for, you know, the, the, the nothing ever happens dynamic, right? Um, but recognizing and taking value from, you know, what are the lessons that we can learn from revolutions broadly, um, war, uh, 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 conflicts of national liberations broadly, and recognizing what are the conditions that allowed for these situations, what, what you know, what are the negatives that came from afterwards, what sorts of sorts of people you need, what sort of organizations you need, what are ideas provide value again? That has that is something that still has relevance today, and that's why history is worth engaging with. And, and where some of you know, there, there's a tremendous amount of value there that should not be discarded um, with the with the you know, contemporary arrogance of thinking that uh, you know new ideas are the only things that can change things. There's a lot of value and wisdom, particularly deconstructing and and the the, the uh, um, revisionist looks at these moments um, because you know obviously you're you're, gonna, you're not going to get the true radical nature of the American Revolution from governments that do not want a recurrence of that similar theme, right? So again, this is why this broader awareness and, and recognition, appreciation of history is a vital lens um, for the pursuit of liberty in the modern day. Um, again, no, no better place to, to tap into that than the American Revolution. And let's look at Rothbard's view on it. Um, he was in favor. Uh, we, we can say that. Big fan. Big fan. <laughs> 
As he wrote a four volume book about it called Conceived Five in volume. Long Five volumes, with, with the addition of the fifth yeah. volume edited by yeah, Patrick Newman. Your notes there. <laughs> and so it's a long book. Let's put it that way. And I, I have noticed that perhaps what's uh, most relevant to what we're discussing here is chapter 80 of uh, volume four. And here's what he says. He, he, he's saying that the American Revolution was radical. Let's stop pretending that it was like some minor thing and it was uh, just about uh, getting the British to lower some taxes or something like that. It went far, far beyond that. Uh, so what Rothbard says here is, quote, the Americans had always been intractable, rebellious, impatient of oppression, as witnessed the numerous rebellions of the late 17th century. They also had their own individualist and libertarian heritage, uh, which he notes goes back to the English Civil War. And uh, he goes on to look at how uh, <laughs> this was very much a liberal revolution animated by the Lockean ideal, which wasn't particularly popular in 18th century America and was really a holdover from 17th century wars. And he goes on to say the American Revolution was radical in uh, many other aspects. It was the first successful war of national liberation against Western imperialism, a people's war waged by the majority of Americans having the courage and the zeal to rise up against constituted legitimate government actually threw off their quote unquote sovereign. This was a revolutionary war led by fanatics and zealots rejecting the siren call of compromise and easy adjustments to the existing system. As a people's war, it was victorious to the extent that guerrilla strategy and tactics were employed against the far more heavily armed and better trained British army, a strategy and tactics of protracted conflict resting precisely on mass support. The tactics of harassment, mobility, surprise, and the wearing down and cutting off supplies finally resulted in the encirclement of the enemy. So he's talking here about full-blown war, uh, and he's, he's drawing upon also a lot of what was going on in the world at the time. There are a lot of the, the context here are things like wars of uh, national liberation, say in Southeast Asia and Africa and so on. This is a period of decolonization that was going on around the world, and Rothbard's looking out there and saying that, yeah, uh, these wars using guerrilla warfare, using long-term, low-level tactics, um, low-intensity tactics against a colonial power, he was all in favor. Rothbard, of course, was hugely in favor of all these secession movements around the world uh, during this time. And he saw their origins in the American Revolution, and he saw the American Revolution as really the model uh, for later wars of liberation of this type. He also notes a lot of stuff that went on domestically, right? He, he notes, for example, that there were uh, huge changes in, say, the land situation. Uh, he, so to, to kind of set that up, he says, uh, the, the naive concept of the revolution as sort of this, this mild affair, which didn't change much, uh, he says that's the naive concept of revolution. And he says that uh, the focus of the upheaval was, of course, Great Britain. The inevitable indirect consequence was radical change within the United States. It was the first and most obvious place. In the first and most obvious place, the success of the revolution meant inevitably the overturn and displacement of the Tory elites, particularly of those internal oligarchs and members of governor's councils who had been created and propped up by the British government. The freeing of trade and manufacture from British imperial shackles again meant a displacement of Tory favorites from positions of economic privilege. So much of what people criticized other countries for, especially Spanish America, where, hey, look, there were these huge land grants to these Spanish elites, and they didn't have the sort of uh, small parcels of land owned by a large number of people like Americans have. That's that's what America had. It had these these Tory elites who were given these humongous land grants, some of which were the size of small states, uh, like right uh, Western Virginia, a lot of these areas. They were owned by just a tiny number of Tory elites, many of whom were just absentee landlords who had never been there. There certainly wasn't any homesteading going on. Uh, and they this land was just handed out to people who had carried out some sort of political function that the crown liked. 
there was a huge period of land redistribution after the war. There were there were huge numbers of Tory elites thrown out of their positions, physically thrown out of the country. There were also, of course, the loyalists physically thrown out of the country uh, because there was a what could be defined in many ways as a civil war. At the local level, the American Revolution was a civil war over who controlled the local government, who controlled the state government. Yes, it was a war of secession, especially at the macro level, but it was also a war to throw out embedded and established elites uh, who had ruled based on the favoritism they had shown uh, the crown back in England. And this was pulled out by the roots in a violent manner and sent packing. And that was all wiped away and it was not replaced uh, in the 1780s, in the late 1770s. It was not replaced until Hamilton and his buddies came along and established the new constitution. And so Rothbard's absolutely correct. This was a very libertarian revolution which took up arms against the established power, threw it out, and did not replace it. There was a far more uh, level, I mean, I mean to, to call back to the, the British levelers who wanted to greatly undo this British hierarchy. And Rothbard also considers the level, levelers to be the first true self-conscious libertarian movement. This is part of the English civil wars in the 17th century. And a lot of their philosophy filtered down to the American revolutionaries who pushed all of that stuff out and didn't set up a replacement. Uh, this is this is the key factor to remember: is that the the there was nothing in the American Revolution that required the replacement of the of the old regime with a similarly uh, with with a similar new regime. There, there, that just simply did not exist in the decade after the revolution started, and even in the years after the revolution was completed in, in 1783 to 1788, there was none of this elite that was put in, back into place. The people who liked that old elite, Washington, Hamilton, their friends, they wanted that back, which is why they wanted the new constitution so they could put that into place. Now, of course, the propaganda has been successful where... Uh, Americans generally believe, oh, the old constitution didn't work, so we needed a new constitution. Otherwise, all of these revolutionaries like Shays Rebellion people would have run amok. Uh, I mean, that's just obviously wrong. The Massachusetts uh, militia had no problem putting down Shays Rebellion. That, th there was no need for some large national government to deal with that. That was what the state uh, militia was for, and it carried it out. Fine. It worked. But nope, they created this myth, this propaganda that said we needed to create this big new government and replace the old elite with a new elite. And that's the only problem then that occurs. But that's not connected directly to the revolution. So all of this very radical stuff that was going on after the revolution, by the way, also slavery went very much into decline for a period after the revolution because people recognized that the, the old ideas of the power elite simply didn't apply anymore. Uh, and it wasn't until later that economic considerations with the invention of the cotton gin and all of that, that slavery started to become uh, this much more popular thing uh, where, oh, we could make a whole lot of money. This very small planter class could make a whole lot of money with a whole lot of slavery. Uh, but that that was later. That wasn't connected to the American Revolution as well. And in fact, as Rothbard knows, it was really just two states, South Carolina and Georgia, that uh, – Put a, put a wrench in the works and prevented the new American Union from uh, really turning away from slavery overall. And really what, what those slave states should have done was just create their own separate union. They should have had their own thing. Uh, and without that, there never would have been a civil war. There wouldn't have been all this constant obsession over slavery throughout the 19th century. You should have just let the Carolinas and Georgia do their own thing. Virginia probably would have become then a non-slave state and would have joined the mid-Atlantic and northern states, and, and it would have been very, very different. Um, without a civil war, of course, there would never have been the state building of the late 19th century that the, that the U.S. had. So it could have been a very different situation. But again, none of this has anything to do, and none of this is required by the existence of the American Revolution. It's just a completely different civil uh, situation. And in fact, I think what we could really say is that the American Revolution was carrying out the original goals of the English Civil Wars, that is of the, the levelers and the other radicals of that period, not Cromwell, who had no real devotion to freedom, but the people who 
had helped Cromwell rather naively, perhaps thinking that after these wars ended, the common man, the bourgeoisie, the the regular middle class people would have much more say over their daily lives. That's that's not what happened. The British state got back to a lot of state building by the end of the 17th century and in the 18th century uh, continued very, very slowly uh, toward continued state building, admittedly on a different model from the absolutist French model, um, but certainly something that fed very much into the modern British state that we see today. It was just the natural progression. Uh, and so Rothbard continually makes this point too, is that in order to really understand the Bill of Rights, the roots of the American Revolution, we do have to go back to the levelers in the English Civil War. So, and this is a point I've made many times on the site too, is if you fancy yourself some sort of expert on the American Revolution, if, if you don't know a lot about the English Civil War, uh, spare me, right? You just, <laughs> you don't know the roots of the American Revolution because that is what so many of these radical American revolutionaries were drawing upon was, was that episode in British history. And if you look back at what the American, what the British dissidents were saying during the English Civil War, so much of its language pops up later in the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is basically just kind of this carryover. It's this restatement of what the levelers uh, were saying during the English Civil Wars. It's just finally the victory of that philosophy carried out in 18th century America rather than in 17th century uh, Britain. Unfortunately, they did put in place this 1780s constitution, which uh, partially undid, uh, Rothbard says partially, uh, but over time, of course, did uh, did the job of undoing most of it with a few, few pieces still surviving in, say, the First and Second Amendment and, and a couple of other places. But uh, sadly, the revolution, the counter-revolution of the 1780s undid most of that. And it is worth noting because I, I can already hear a, um, a, a conservative in a, in a more serious term, not, not the modern word, um, kind of response that, it, it, that, you know, the fact that centralizing elites ended up winning the larger battle does not mean that there were not elites that were firmly entrenched and, and led, inspired by these ideological roots of the revolution. It's not as if the revolution just simply created a void and therefore that void inevitably led to the reestablishment of a, you know, a quasi, you know, British sort of system afterwards, right? You know, there, there was, um, you know, for, for a, a very long period of time, you know, there, there was this very clear ideological split amongst um, uh, political elites in this country, some of which were still firmly rooted within the intellectual tradition that gave birth to the movement. It wasn't simply kind of the, these 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 unwashed ras, uh, uh, you know, masses, right? These these rebel rousers that were kind of being kind of useful uh, uh, useful innocents to use the the Mises this term. It's a lot nicer than the the other one. Um, that were kind of just utilized in order to prop up a a new version of the of the British system here in the United States. There were there were a, a very real group of elites, some of which, um, you know, uh, you, you brought up Shays Rebellion. I mean, Shays Rebellion itself was very much a movement that, uh, you know, it, it was not just anarchy and chaos, right? You know, their, their targets were um, institutions of power that they viewed as illegitimate. Um, you know, they, they focused on courthouses. They weren't just going around kind of burning down property and, and having sort of, again, reign of terror style French you know, revolutionary sort of violence, right? I mean, it was a very, um, a fairly disciplined, focused response to post-revolutionary oppressions that they saw it. Um, there were leading figures and landowners in that class of, again, what we would what we'd consider proper elites that supported that movement. So, you know, and, and then, of course, this continues on with, you know, John Randolph and, and uh, Nathaniel Macon and the Republicans that became disillusioned with what the Jeffersonian wing end up, ended up becoming an institutional practice, right, of, of you know, Jefferson, the president, not the philosopher, of Madison, of Monroe, of that, that era of good feelings where, you know, Republicans essentially became Federalists um, in terms of practice and the growth of the state, right? You know, this, these were the, you know, it, it, these were the leaders that ended up kind of giving birth to and, and you know, having a, a resurgence in relevance during the Jacksonian era 
um, which as we've talked in the past goes beyond Andrew Jackson himself as a figure, but all these intellectuals and political figures that kind of you know helped create that infrastructure afterwards that helped restore, um, you know, bring, you know uh, broke away some of the, the state building that did occur um, in that, that peak um, uh, constitutional centralist era um, following the Constitutionalist Revolution. So again, like there, there were serious elites. There, there was a class of, of leaders that, um, and the anti-federalists obviously um, being the, the, the big organizational focus during the battles of the Constitution itself. So again, this was not simply a, um, a movement of the unsophisticated masses with guns being utilized and duped by people at the top. You know, there were a depth of this movement inspired by these ideas um, again, it's unfortunate the way everything played out afterwards, and there's there's a variety of different causes um, that that helped bring about what we have today. And of course, we can always have that large conversation of you know when when was the American Revolution really finally killed? Right? You know, was it the Constitution? Was it something thereafter? Or words? You know, various moments in the 20th century. Um, the answer is all of the above, right? To a certain degree, um, you know. But this was not simply a a the the the, the mentality the ideology was not simply of a a useful but politically impotent mass there were genuine leaders and and you know there, there, there was an alternative to what what we had you know it, it, it did help um cre- you know there, there, there were significant pushback and again recognition at, at the time that the ideas of the revolution were falling alongside um with the ever approaching growth of the centralizing power. So again, I think that's that's an element that also needs to be appreciated. And this is why you're so much. Uh, that's why yeah, obviously worth noting uh, Patrick Newman's book on cronyism. But understanding those figures that were leading this battle during that period, there's a there's a tremendous amount of of incredible um, um, kind of you know, relatively unknown figures from that time. Beyond you know the, the obvious one being Thomas Jefferson, but there's a variety of of um, these these. Uh, uh, Republican, uh, uh, radical, liberal thinkers and leaders during this time that that deserve recognition and reckoning with um, in order to kind of better understand this historical period. Well, Rothbard covers a lot of this um, when he looks at the fight over the revolution. And the reason, of course, you haven't heard of a lot of these people who opposed the new constitution, who were in favor, who were elites, as you note, um, and were in favor of very highly localized government. In many cases, they were in favor of uh, universal suffrage, which, of course, that's that's a separate debate. But it worked in the 19th century. Universal suffrage worked fine in many of these places where the, the masses voted in favor of local rule, of low taxes, of small government, of the abolition of government welfare programs. That continued through much of the 19th century. And definitely, we need to make the point that when did the Constitution really really ruin the revolution? I think the argument could be made that it wasn't until the 1890s that was really the case. Yes, you can argue that the Civil War, of course, undid the original notion of the Articles of Confederation, which was that the United States was this union of independent republics. However, the general overall philosophy behind the revolution of leaving people alone, of low taxation, of sound money, of free trade, of uh, just general freedom in your daily life, also, uh, quote unquote, isolationism, a unwillingness to get involved in international wars. This all continued through Grover Cleveland's administration. And as Rothbard points out, it wasn't until the 1890s that the final stake was driven through the heart of the laissez-faire party uh, in American politics. So with that, you could argue that there actually was a significant degree of success there, especially, I mean, you look at which regime would you rather live under as just a regular middle-class merchant type person in the 19th century, England, France, Germany, Italy. It's an easy question to answer. It's the United States. You want to live in the United States, especially in those areas where the liberals uh, continue to uh, exercise a significant degree of power, which uh, ironically, given today's uh, context, New York and New Jersey, hotbeds of free market liberalism for a long, long time. I mean, it's not, it's not an accident that Cleveland 
uh, grew up essentially in New Jersey and New York, uh, that he had some deep roots in both of those places. That's where there that's where there was a lot of devotion to sound money, to liberalism. And the Jeffersonian ideal continued for a long time through those areas and also in a lot of the border states uh, as well. And so we look back at that and we think, uh, oh, gee, uh, well, sure, they brought in the new constitution. I guess that was just a really short lived revolutionary period. And well, the philosophy lived on. It lived on in the form of the Jeffersonians and their supporters uh, that continued on through much of the 19th century. And even into the early 20th century, even as the United States started to go down further and further uh, imperialist roads with the Spanish-American War and so on. In 1910, was America a good place to live? Yeah. It, in terms of taxation, in terms of government regulation, they were extremely weak, extremely weak government in that period. So you can't really discount just the, the staying power of the radical liberalism of the 18th century that carried down from the revolution in spite of what happened at the Constitutional Convention in efforts for a new elite to really assert itself. They did assert themselves. They put in place all of those horrible things that led to the 20th century in America that we can now point to. The New Deal, the FDR, the nonstop wars, the national security state. This is all stuff that Alexander Hamilton would have loved. Of course, it's worth, worth noting, and to, to that point, is that you know, obviously, we are dealing with the the curse of of Hamiltonianism still today. But you know, it it was it took one term, you know, four years after you know the, the after Washington left office, right? You know, the, the godlike figure. It took just simply four years for the Hamiltonian party to get thrown out of power, right? So, and and, and it was rejected repeatedly with with, with Henry Clay's uh, you know nonstop uh, uh, political campaigning and constant failure there. So again, the the, the American public uh, was never particularly keen. For that Hamiltonian vision, you know, during those early days, I mean, it, it, Adams got one year, and then again, that Washington's political party, the, the the political party of God Emperor King, right, you know, the, the the founder of the country, was thrown out of office four years because of the consequences of it and and the the response to those policies. And so again, it was not entrenched from the get go. Um, they they did have a head start with Washington, but again, there there was political change almost immediately afterwards. Um, which I think speaks to that point as well. Well, it's a good point, too, that the election of 1800 was in itself a sort of a counter-revolution against the counter-revolution, right. where, yeah, you had you had the Declaration of Independence, which established secession as a natural right and led to the breakup of this larger state. And then you had the counter-revolution about 11 years later. But then, and as you know, right, then, then you get Adams, <laughs> after Washington, and immediately you get the Alien and Sedition Acts, right? Just blatantly immoral and unconstitutional sort of legislation, which probably would have continued nonstop, except the Jeffersonians then came in in 1800 and allowed that to expire and really pushed back on the original Constitution and asserted a lot of the philosophy of the revolutionary period. So all the Americans involved in that counter-revolution of 1800 were really trying to recapture, and in many cases were very successful for decades afterward, the spirit of the revolution. There's a good book on this, by the way, that I reviewed years ago. It's like a 20-year-old book. It's called Adams versus Jefferson. And uh, I, I believe John Furling is the uh, author on that. Furling also had written a um, uh, a long biography on John Adams. I mean, he gives John Adams some uh, fair treatment. He doesn't hold up Adams as a real villain or anything. But he, but Adams isn't really the good guy of the story either. Uh, and in fact, I think the way that Furling shows that Adams was, was a relatively good guy is that he wasn't nearly as bad as Hamilton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so take that uh, if, if, if you like uh, something that's fairly balanced. But have a look at that book. And that shows the, the triumph of the Jeffersonians to a certain extent in really getting back the, uh, the spirit of the revolution. And of course, if there had not been a revolution, then there wouldn't have been, we wouldn't be talking about any of this. It would have just been ongoing British elites uh, carrying out the sort of garbage they did throughout the 19th century, lecturing the common people about how they need someone to rule over them in London. And again, are, <laughs> are Americans better off now than they would have been had they stuck with uh, the British crown? Well, we can look at England now. We can look at England's respect for uh, civil rights, the fact that you can get arrested for criticizing Muslims in England now. 
you might say that America has a lot of that same sort of thing going on, but uh, the United States is really one of the last few outposts that actually respects freedom of speech to some extent. The U.S. is one of the last few outposts where, of course, there's any respect for the right to bear arms. Uh, this is this all goes back to the revolution and to the proliferation of these old ideas from 17th century England, most of which were stuffed down and destroyed in Britain itself a long, long time ago, where absolutism never really quite died. And that's all something you have to keep in mind. So, yes, I think the people who oppose the American Revolution, I think they can make some some decent points, things that need to be considered. Uh, but really, in the end, I please point to me the European states that did not have some sort of secession movement where they just love freedom nowadays. They love natural rights nowadays. They have an even better Bill of Rights. There's not a whole lot that you can point to. I mean, if you're going to point to countries that are better off, they tend to be countries that are very small uh, <laughs> and have a very different, uh, I don't know, tradition, you might say. I mean, we could look at the Swiss tradition, which is very, very different. Although, ironically, the 1848 Swiss Constitution is based on the American Constitution. They just do it much better. Because A, they're much smaller, they're much more devoted to localism and to balancing actual powers within the state. I think if we could make a point about where the U.S. Constitution really went wrong, I think we would then have to talk about just how wrong uh, James Madison was. Madison was simply wrong about this I whole idea that Republicans, republics work best when they're very, very large. I think the the social the American security state that we groan under today is a result of the very large American state. The fact that the American federal government has become this intractable power that is extremely difficult to reform is the fact that it's captured by huge, large national interests. Madison just, Madison claimed that wouldn't happen with his new constitution. It happened. The constitution failed by Madison's own standards. So that's all stuff that needs to be uh, reevaluated and we need to have a look at. But none of that indicts the American Revolution. None of that tells me that the American Revolution was a bad idea or that it failed. Uh, so really where, where criticism has to be is with the constitution of the 1780s, not with the revolution, not with the Declaration of Independence, and not with the American uh, original constitution of the 1770s. Ryan, before we get out of here, um, have to ask: How do you celebrate your uh, your Independence Day? Uh, well, last night I went to the local, the local, um, uh, <laughs> like municipal fireworks thing. You know, I walk over there, I watch it, clap, and then I go home. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm old, I'm tired. So on a Tuesday night, I don't do a whole lot of that. But uh, you know barbecue. I mean, what, what are we supposed to do? Uh, so because of my job, I read stuff like the Declaration of Independence all the time. So there's not really a whole lot of novelty there. But I would recommend to regular people, people with real jobs, that, uh, they, uh, that they do read actually the entire text of the Declaration of Independence. I think that would be a really good idea. I think they should read the entire text of the original Constitution from the 1770s, which people call the Articles of Confederation. I think that would be a great idea and something for somebody to do. And yeah, also have your local parade. Also build up your local community, right? If you if you ever, if we have any hope of undoing the power of the current state, it's gonna have to come from competing institutions, community institutions, religious institutions. Uh, the state is not gonna be replaced by just a bunch of atomistic individuals running around talking about how they don't need anybody and they're just going to live out in the country with their guns and their dogs and they, they don't want to associate with other people who are a big pain in the butt. Those people are antisocial weirdos, people who are building up a good society. They're involved in civic organizations. They're building up alternative institutions. And so we need a lot more of that. So sure, do some of that on the 4th of July. That's how you can stick your thumb in the eye of the regime. Build up institutions that aren't the U.S. government. Um, they hate that, and that's always a good way to go. Yeah, can I add anything on that? That's some great advice right there. All right, well, thank you for listening to this edition of Radio Rothbard. And uh, we'll be back next week with uh, another episode. So enjoy your long weekend if you get one. Hopefully you'll get the fourth off at least a little bit or it'll be a light day for you. 
and uh, you really can appreciate uh, the degree of independence, the tradition that was established by our revolutionaries a long time ago. So happy Independence Day, and we'll see you next time.